Hello and welcome to episode 37 of the Air Hug Community Podcast. Hey, welcome to the Air Hug Community. I am Judy Arizoza, your host. And I created the Air Hug community to bring you stories from guests and myself that ultimately help improve the lives of others and boomerang back to improve your life. So we cover all sorts of topics like relationships and personal development, how you see the world, and just behaviors that actually affect yourself and others. So... Strap in, sit down, welcome, and thank you so much for joining in. Hello, everybody, and I am super excited today because I have a very special guest coming on today, and I'm not going to tell you too much because I'm going to let him introduce himself, and then we're just going to have a little chat. So today, our guest is Dr. Jade Tita. So welcome, Jade, and thank you so very much for taking the time to chat with us today in the Air Hug community. Uh, Judy, thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here and looking forward to the discussion. All right, so gosh, there were so many things I could have asked you today. So just as a little bit of a background, um, Jade, in my mind, is a metabolism expert and a mindset expert. And today we're gonna lean a, a little bit more towards metabolism, but who knows? We might chat about whatever comes up, but... Um, I started following Dr. Jade way back when his first, well, the first book that I was aware of came out with Metabolic Effect. And also my first nutrition certifications, the first three were through Dr. Jade, Tita and Metabolic Effect. And so that's where, that's where I became acquainted with you and was, have been reading everything pretty much that you put out ever since. So what I want to, I'd love to start today with um, you know, a lot of the people who listen to this and a lot of the people that I talk to are women in midlife. Mm -hmm. And so this whole thing about perimenopause, menopause and menopause and stress starts to come up. And so how do I ask this question? I, I actually would like to ask it in pertaining to overtraining because I still have a hard time with both myself and a lot of people with more is better, you know, in that whole eat more exercise or eat less exercise more thing. And I finding that, you know, myself being 60 years old, it doesn't always work. So tell me well, what yeah, you think about that. Here, here's part of the issue. I love that we're starting here because I do think this is a very confusing concept for a lot of people. And the reason it's confusing is because primarily of the way we perceive stress. So there's two ways we can look at stress. We can look at stress psychologically, right? This is how most of us look at it. Stress feels like psychological tension. It feels like emotional overwhelm. It feels like something going on in our heads, we, we oftentimes think if it's stressful, we have to be aware of it. But this is not how the metabolism looks at stress at all. You could be completely stressed out metabolically and 1000% fine in your head. And this is where things get confused. And so for a minute, as we begin this discussion, let's talk about what it's like for the metabolism to be under stress, because this is what needs to be understood. Try to think, I think we all need to try to think about stress in the way we perceive it in our head as very differently in, in what the metabolism is measuring as stress. So from the metabolism's perspective, all it really is, the, the easiest way to think about metabolism is as a sensing and responding apparatus. So in a sense, it is sensing the outside world, light, temperature, food availability, um, physical demands, uh, sleep rhythms, um, all of these kinds of things. So it's picking up all these signals. It's also picking up signals though from inside the body, right? What your liver cells need, what your digestive tract is doing, what your muscles are doing and how they're metabolizing things. And all this is by the way, going on in the area of the brain, which I call the command and control center of the metabolism, the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus is taking on in all this outside information 
and it's taking in all this inside information and it's looking to see how it needs to respond to keep balance between the two, the outside demands and the inside demands. And so what happens with most people is they don't understand that when the metabolism is under stress, there was one stress in particular that the metabolism, as it evolved over 2 million years, roughly, um, roughly uh, 400,000, we start thinking about our human ancestors. The one stress that it dealt with more than any other stress was the starvation stress. So in other words, the metabolism was always mostly concerned with, can I get food, stay alive and reproduce? And so anytime the metabolism feels under stress, it really institutes the starvation response. And so let's talk about what causes the metabolism to feel under stress. The biggest thing is the gap between what we are doing in terms of energy we are taking in and what we are doing in terms of energy we are putting out. Because if you think about that, intake and output, the gap between calories in and calories out, this is directly related to how the metabolism feels about survival, because it does not, you know, sort of psychologically get that we are in an environment where food is everywhere. It is simply working on the demands that it evolved with. It doesn't have a conscious brain like we do in a sense. It's working unconsciously. And so it's constantly looking at intake and output. Now, what we have rightly decided in our culture and seen uh, without a shadow of a doubt that when you have too much coming in and not enough going out, this is obviously a stress to the metabolism. It does metabolic damage, right? It creates disease. This is the typical couch potato lifestyle. So we're very aware of that. And we know all the ramifications of that. It doesn't make us feel very good. We have increased risk of cancer and cardiovascular disease. It interrupts our sleep. It does all kinds of things that we can feel in our body. Now, in response to that, our conscious brain goes, well, then I should do the opposite. I should do eat less, exercise more. And that is absolutely true up to a point. But then all of a sudden, the gap gets wider on the other end. Now, instead of eating more and exercising less, you are doing too much activity and not taking in enough food. And this is also a stress to the metabolism. So whether the calorie gap is being created by the couch potato lifestyle or whether that calorie gap is being created by the dieter lifestyle, it doesn't matter as far as the metabolism is concerned. All it sees is this stress between intake and output. And once that begins to happen, you start to have the metabolism push back against you. Now, isn't it funny that couch potatoes and dieters often suffer from the same things? They oftentimes are both very hungry. They oftentimes both suffer from low energy and they oftentimes have cravings and they have issues with libido and they have issues with exercise performance and exercise recovery and all the same things. And by the way, this is how you know when you are under stress as an individual. Forget what you're thinking about emotional stress. Just go, am I hungry all the time? Am I fighting my energy levels all the time? Are my cravings through the roof? Is my exercise performance and exercise recovery or even motivation for exercise in general there or not? And how is my sleep? Is it fragmented? Is it uh, you know, creating issues this way? Once you sort of understand that language, because remember, the metabolism doesn't speak English, it speaks metabolism. And when it speaks metabolism, it is showing you, I'm hungry, I'm having energy fluctuations, I'm cravings, my libido is low, my exercise performance, my exercise recovery, my motivation, my sleep, my mood, my digestion, my signs and symptoms, if I got diseases, if I suffer from headaches and stuff like that, all of these are signs that we are further pushing our stress barometer, and that is the real way to look at metabolism as a stress barometer, we are putting more uh, pressure on that barometer. So it doesn't matter if you're an over-exerciser or an under-exerciser. If you're an overeater or an under-eater, you are putting your metabolism under stress. And this is why it is so damaging to go from one extreme, the couch potato model, to another extreme, the dieting marathoner or the crossfitting paleo man or the you know weightlifting keto person you can't you don't want to go from one stress to the next so that's the first place to start and i'll as we go into the next place you want to go i'll just drop a hint here for women compared to men 
there is really good rationale to suggest that their stress barometer is a little bit more sensitive and refined compared to a male. Why? Because they are the gender of child bearing, right? And so they have to make accounts for not just their own survival, but the potential survival of another human being. A man and the male metabolism does not really have to do this. And so women in particular have hormonal uh, sort of rhythms and realities that uh, confer benefit actually to them in terms of their stress management. And when you get into perimenopause and menopause and postmenopause, a new reality starts to take shape because you begin to lose the benefit of these stress protectors in a sense. Yeah, I love all of that because um, first of all, you know, we are so different. And then we're different from when we were 20 years ago and we're different because each of us is unique. Mm -hmm. But I love this way that you put the story, especially when you talk about getting from, you know, childbearing years to perimenopause to menopause to postmenopause. You talk about the non-identical twin sisters. I love that. Mm -hmm. an analogy with estrogen and progesterone. And I think that's um, something that a lot of, of us misunderstand. Mm. Yeah, it, it really is. I'm glad you like that because one of the things is when you're trying to translate complex chemistry and, and endocrinology, the study of hormones to the lay person, it's very difficult to just talk about what these hormones do. You want to kind of give it uh, um, some character and tell a story about it. So the story that I tell about estrogen and progesterone to help people remember this is the story of twin sisters, non-identical twin sisters. And so you might say, well, why non-identical twin sisters? They're twin sisters because estrogen and progesterone are a thousand percent reliant on each other. Um, not like other hormones, they need each other to function, similar to how twins are. However, they have a different uh, actions. They overlap in some areas, but they're, but they're uh, unique in some areas. And so let's talk about the estrogen sister. Estrogen is a hormone that has, and remember, to start this discussion, you have receptors for estrogen and progesterone all over the body, not just in the breast and the uterus and the ovaries, but also in the fat cells, in the brain tissue, in the muscle, in the liver, et cetera. So estrogen, what it is doing in the body is it is raising serotonin levels or potentiating serotonin. This is a brain chemical that makes you feel self-assured, gives you good self-esteem and relaxes you. It also potentiates dopamine, which helps you feel focused, motivated, and ambitious. And it also does things that allow the body to push harder under stress. For example, it reduces the effects of the stress hormone cortisol. It helps the insulin hormone work better to manage the calories that we take in. And so the way to think about estrogen is the entrepreneurial sister, the adventurous sister, the ambitious sister, the focused driven sister, the one that will go out and take risks and wants to get dirty and, you know, wants to chase life in a <laughs> sense. It's if she feels alive and she just wants to run out there and attack life. Now we know what that's like. I want to go on vacation with her. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Right. We all want to go on vacation with estrogen. The thing with estrogen though, is she can get herself in trouble if she doesn't have a checks and balances system. Like we all know people like this and we all know the way we were when we were younger. We did things that may not have been so smart because we weren't thinking about them. So this is the way to think about estrogen. If she gets too ahead of herself, she can get in trouble, but she is sort of the the resilient, rambunctious, powerful sort of bodybuilder, fitness athlete sister. Now, the other sister, progesterone, is more sort of the nerdy, worried, future-oriented, stay at home, play the piano, read books. She's very in her head. She's more introverted. She is very concerned that, progest uh, that estrogen is not really uh, being future-oriented enough. And she's worried that her sister is going to get them in trouble. And so progesterone is always after estrogen saying, calm down, we, we might have a baby coming and we need to be careful and we need to save our food supplies. And so unlike estrogen, that uh, is all about managing calories and using calories to its advantage, progesterone wants to store up calories. So it makes the body insulin resistant. It wants to store calories for later use. 
but it does work with estrogen to help balance against stress. And you might say, well, why would progesterone make the body insulin resistant? Why would it raise blood sugar levels perhaps and give us a little bit more triglycerides and that kind of thing? Well, because she's worried that a baby might be coming along. Remember, uh, during the menstrual cycle for a young woman, the first half of the menstrual cycle is estrogen out playing by herself. Progesterone is still taking a nap. She hasn't woken up yet. She wakes up later. Estrogen wakes up early and attacks the world. After ovulation, progesterone comes on board. And at that point in time, from ovulation to menses, you have more progesterone. Well, what might happen in that time period? Well, right after ovulation is the time an egg might get fertilized. And so we may be dealing with a fetus that needs extra food and extra time and extra care. Progesterone is the sister that looks out for that and essentially says, we might need more blood sugar for this baby that's coming along. So it's important to kind of understand this. Now, another way I like to explain is to make it a little bit easier for people is I like to uh, think about Joan of Arc. Most people can picture Joan of Arc. She's wearing a, a suit of armor. She has a shield and she has a sword. Well, estrogen blocks insulin and cortisol. So it's more protective. It's the armor. Progesterone blocks cortisol, but has a negative effect on insulin. So it's protective, but not as much. So it's the shield. And the sword is testosterone. Now, as women start going into menopause, what begins to happen is ovulation doesn't occur as often. So what happens is if ovulation doesn't occur, progesterone stays in bed. She's ill. It's like she's got the flu. She's not going to come out to play. That means the shield is gone. It means estrogen has the reins off her and estrogen wants her sister to be there. But what happens is if the sister isn't there, if progesterone isn't there, estrogen becomes very volatile. At times she's high and rambunctious. At other times she's sad and missing her sister. This is perimenopause, a period where sometimes you feel almost manic and fantastic and everything feels back to normal. And then other times women tell me they feel absolutely horrible. They feel depressed. They don't, they feel unmotivated. They feel cravings and hunger all over the place and they can't make heads or tails. There's hot flashes. There's all these things that their body's just not doing what it used to do. And this is because progesterone is gone. So it's a very volatile time. But if you understand the story I just told you, what's the fix then at this point? Well, if progesterone is gone and she is the sister that's always playing mother to estrogen, then this means the woman now has to play mother to herself a little bit more right about perimenopause. She can no longer put herself out as much for other people. She needs to start putting her oxygen mask on first before helping others. She needs to spend perhaps an extra hour in bed rather than an extra hour on the treadmill. She needs to start paying a little bit more attention to the Goldilocks effect of not too much but uh, and not too little exercise and not too much and not too little food and not too much and not too little carbohydrates. She really has to start paying attention to stress management at this time and managing the stress barometer. This is perimenopause, but most women instead, they go, well, what worked for me when I was a young woman should work for me now and I'll just do more of it and do it more frequently or harder or longer. And that is the exact wrong approach because that simply opens that calorie gap up wider and causes more stress during a time when progesterone is not around and you simply cannot tolerate more stress. So right around perimenopause, women need to start moving into a very stress reducing lifestyle, more, more long walks with their dog in the woods versus high intensity interval training and orange theory and power yoga and all this kind of stuff. So that's the story on sort of the twin sisters and the beginning of the story of perimenopause. And I'll see where you want to go next because I know I'm sort of rambling here. No, I am just so, I love this explanation and it just, it, it, it really helps because it's so tempting and I've been tempted many times to just work harder, just do a longer workout, just do a harder workout. Um, fortunately, I really like to walk and so walking is awesome and I'm so excited to have permission to walk and I love what you said I just want to reiterate because I feel like it's like let's just get to the middle let's not over exercise or under exercise so I know you're not telling us to sit on the couch right mm, but you're not telling not. us you're not telling us to do 90 minute workouts either no definitely not and really um this is the hard part with this right because you might say well how do I know as a woman right how do I know if I'm doing too much or too little Here's how you know. So I have this funny little saying that I've kind of become famous for. Sleep, hunger, mood, energy, and cravings. S-H-M-E-C. 
or Schmeck. Schmeck in Czech means your hormones are in balance. And so this is the language of metabolism. Rather than talking about ghrelin and leptin and cortisol and insulin and estrogen and progesterone, we could just say, well, what are they affecting all these hormones? Well, they're affecting sleep, hunger, mood, energy, and cravings. Schmeck. If Schmeck is in check, I can pretty much guarantee my hormonal symphony, my hormonal orchestra is playing beautiful music. However, if Schmeck goes out of check, I can be assured that I am now stressing my system out a little bit. And so the idea is you don't want to do so little of exercise and eating that you are overeating and, and, and um, under exercising because that will throw Schmeck out of check. And also over exercising and under eating will, will throw Schmeck out of check. So if you're sitting here saying, you know, to me, actually, my Schmeck is in check. Um, then I'm going to go, then you're doing the right amount of exercise. You're doing just fine. The other thing you want to look at is, well, are you getting results? Because a stress, a metabolism that doesn't think it's in starvation pretty much easily burns its fat stores because it doesn't try to hold on to them for a rainy day. So in addition to Schmeck, you want to go, am I attaining or maintaining optimal body composition? If you have both of those things correct, then you're doing the right amount, even if it looks like a lot to someone else. However, if your Schmeck is not in check and you're not getting the results commiserate with your, um, commensurate with your activity level, then you can rest assured you probably need to do less, not none, but less. And so instead of doing six days a week of long workouts, maybe you do six days a week of shorter workouts. Instead of doing six days a week of shorter workouts, maybe you need to go three days per week of more moderate workouts. You have to begin to play metabolic detective here because Estrogen and progesterone are no longer working for you. And by the way, this isn't just with more mature women. This is also for more immature women. And maybe those, that immature is not the best word to use for that, but younger women, <laughs> you know, um, premenopausal women. This also is for premenopausal women as well, because a premenopausal woman that's stressed out is going to go through some of the exact same things. And by the way, a premenopausal woman during menses is in a mini menopause. And so in a sense, she's hitting menopause right there for, you know, three to seven days for, for those women in that time period. She needs to take the same care that you and I are talking about now. Uh, menses, to me, hormonally speaking, just looking at it as a dude who just studies this stuff and doesn't experience this stuff, on paper, menses looks exactly like menopause. Pre-menses looks a lot like perimenopause. So every month, a younger woman is getting to experience a brief period of time where she's in perimenopause and a brief period of time where she's in menopause. And the same approach works. At that period of time, you need to be regulating your stress a little bit more. Now, the next part of this story is once you go into menopause, now you lose your armor as well. So now estrogen is low progesterone is low as well. Now you are becoming more insulin resistant, which means the amount of calories and or carbs. And you really don't want to separate these two because they're very difficult to separate. In other words, a lower calorie diet is usually almost always also a lower carb diet. And a lower carb diet is usually almost always necessarily a lower calorie diet. So it's very difficult to tease those two things apart. So once insulin or once estrogen is gone, insulin management and the effects of calories and carbohydrates on insulin become more of a challenge. So now in addition to watching stress, women have to begin to pay attention to calories and carbohydrates. And one of the moves that is usually very useful to make here is if a woman has always been a calorie counter and always conscious of calories, her best move at that point may be simply to begin counting carbs instead. Since carbs are the macronutrient that is most, for most people, mostly impacting insulin. Um, in some people, protein does it a little bit more as well, especially certain types of protein. But this becomes, menopause becomes a time where it's like double down on stress management and also begin looking at this Goldilocks effect of calories, not too little, not too much, and carbs, not too little, not too much. This begins to solve a lot, a lot of issues for women. And now post-menopause, is basically pretty much like menopause for most women. But the way that um, I like to explain this is now imagine, you know, Joan of Arc is out there fighting with her sword and her sword gets broken in half. In other words, she still has a sword. She still has some testosterone. 
It's much lower than it was. It did fall, but it's, it's relatively higher than it used to be to estrogen and progesterone, which is why many women can oftentimes start to masculinize a little bit. They start to look a little bit more like men in their older as they age. And men, by the way, do the same thing. We see this where men become a little bit more estrogenized and start to look a little bit more phenotypically like women. So what's the, the trick here? Well, you've got a little bit more testosterone than you used to. Weight training is probably going to be one of the things to begin to do to utilize some of this more anabolic hormone, since the other anabolic hormone that you used to have, estrogen, is no longer there in the amounts that you want. And by the way, uh, many women will be prescribed testosterone and feel wonderful on it. Part of the reason they feel so good on it, because with testosterone, you're getting a two for one in a sense. You can aromatize testosterone into estrogen. And so when you're giving some testosterone, you basically get your sword back and you get, you know, you might not get like, you know, the full armor, but you get some like, you know, leather armor or something you get, you do get some estrogen <laughs> from that. Right. And so that's part of the reason why. And so with this whole story now, it turns into this one, two, three take home first move from a exercise centric approach to your lifestyle to a stress centric, a stress reducing centric approach, which means walking, more than exercising, which means doing other things that lower stress, like contrast hydrotherapy, you know, the alternating of hot and cold baths or long hot baths. Um, we oftentimes don't like to talk about sex and orgasm and all this stuff, especially as people get older for whatever reason, I think it's silly, but this is the time to sort of double down on these kind of experiences that relax us. So connecting with loved ones, physical affection, sex, orgasm, all of these things do it, creative pursuits, are one of the best ways. So painting, coloring, playing instruments, things like that. Um, uh, Purpose-driven things, volunteering, um, starting businesses, all of these things are protected, protection against uh, stress hormones. Time with pets, as long as they're not stressing you out. Like I've got a new puppy and right now it's a little bit stressful. Um, you know, but in general, if they stop peeing on the floor and all that kind of stuff, it becomes a very beautiful sort of physical affection type relationship. So all of these things, spa time, right? Now think about how many women are planning these kind of rest and recovery workouts instead of their general workouts. Um, this is partly what needs to happen. So that's step one. Step two is the diet that once worked for you probably is not going to work for you now at this stage. And so you're probably going to need to eat less calories and carbs than you thought. The first smart move is to reduce the carbohydrates and to start managing them and counting those things first. Raising fiber, raising protein, maybe, uh, and, you know, because that will satiate you and lower carbs naturally, but you may actually need to begin to count your carbohydrate grams. This is a big one. And then moving away from things that don't allow you to build muscle tissue and things like that, like long duration cardio. And by the way, I'm not saying don't do that stuff. I'm just saying, don't make it the dominant form of your activity. If you've never lifted weights, um, you want to start doing that. And I'm not saying that because I'm a big muscle bound guy who likes to lift weights. I'm saying that because we have the physiology here of utilizing testosterone to keep the body sort of tight when estrogen is not there. And so that one, two, three is the best approach here for women. And I've been doing this, really been working with uh, perimenopause, menopausal and postmenopausal women, literally since the age of like 20, my early 20s. And this is so this is something I had to figure out um, first. And then I also started to see the research and I refined this. But this approach to me is the approach that works. And I've now trained practitioners all over the world, actually, in some of these methods. And you would not believe the amount of feedback I'm constantly getting that, oh my God, this works. Finally, something works. In fact, mm -hmm. I created a program off of this that is the first program in my mind that's ever been geared to specific female physiology that has just blown my mind in terms of the amount of people who get results from this program. So once you hear the explanation, it's a little bit complicated, but once you hear the one, two, three steps of what to do, starts to be like, okay, I can do that. Now, the trick is, can you change your psychology around enough to give yourself permission to ease up on all the craziness? Yeah, that's a huge thing because 
so many people that I talk to just want to fall back on what used to work. I used to do this. I used to do this. And, and I think the cravings in the sleep are really big signs. I love, first of all, I have to laugh because I love your, um, what do you call them when you have initials for something? Acronyms. Acronyms. Yep. I couldn't, I don't know where that, I couldn't find that word. Yeah, yeah. I love your acronyms and they have always made me laugh. And I've quoted your schmeck probably hundreds of times at this point. Mm. Um, and I love that. But uh, it's, it's, it's frustrating, I think, in our mind to realize that we aren't the same people that we were. And it's almost like, how do we get our brains to realize this is the new normal? It's mm. almost like the world today with the pandemic, like this is the new normal. We aren't going back. I don't want to get too political here or anything, but we really can't unsee what we've seen. Mm. And like as women in menopause and post-menopause, we really, again, we can't, un we can't go back. Yeah. So I think that's a really important way to look at it. And I also think that one of the things that I think is um, really interesting and beautiful to kind of talk about here is that, um, we humans, I've been talking about this a lot. We humans are contagious, just like a virus. So you bring up the pandemic and we have this contagious virus floating around, but we humans are contagious. In other words, um, our experience and our purpose is contagious. And so when we have success in this kind of thing, and you are doing this, which is a beautiful thing to kind of pass on to women. You know, it was, I was in, it was interesting to learn that you just started doing this at 50 and getting into sort of weight training and all this kind of stuff at, you know, at 50 years old. And look at all the lives you get to touch. Now, what happens is, is that that kind of purpose-driven lifestyle is the number one thing in, uh, in research and in uh, sort of my personal experience that shields people against stress. It's not that you're not going to have it psychologically or metabolically, but it actually shields you in all kinds of ways from this. And so what I would say is the next piece as for women who are having a hard time making this journey, part of the most beautiful thing you can begin to do is stop looking at it as a personal uh, journey and start looking at it as the hero's journey. Now, what does the hero do? The hero essentially figures it out for themselves and then comes back and teaches it to their tribe. And this then puts it forward. And this to me is, if you can look at it from that point of view that I'm gonna figure this out so that my daughters and my granddaughters can figure this out and so that my best friends who have been struggling can figure this out. We, that's how we sort of uh, pay this forward. And I do think that kind of mindset allows a lot of us to essentially go, oh, if it's for others, then I will take this on and deal with the confusion and figure it out for myself. It's often not enough when it's just about vanity. And this, this is an, another thing that as we all age, looking good, is not as important as it once was. Feeling good becomes a little bit more important. Functioning better becomes a little bit more important. Living longer becomes a little bit more important. But what becomes most important is what we are living for and the message that we are sending with the choices we make. We humans are contagious silently. We don't necessarily have to say we're doing X, Y, Z. All we have to do is show up and do it. And other people will be inspired by that. And this to me is partly um, what I think we can do stress management wise as well. This is amazing because you pretty much have like read my mind. I'm just going to switch headphones here if, it, if they do switch. No, they're not. Oh yeah, they are. All right. Well, not the smoothest transition, but we did it. Yeah. <laughs> All the things that you were saying, and we did talk about a little, a little bit about this before we uh, started to record was a lot of the, like my own transition has gone from, you know, one of, of aesthetics of being judged by aesthetics to going to my internal purpose of figuring this out. And then the whole reason really for this podcast is to help improve the lives of others. And I'm trying to do that by, basically helping women live through my mistakes so they don't make as many of them. And then we go through it together. So it's amazing to me that you brought that up and it's, it's just, I don't know, it's very reassuring to just I, think of it that way. Yeah. I, I think it's, um, it's incredibly um, powerful for all of us humans to kind of think of that as um, what we're actually here for, because in the end, 
Um, I do think a lot of people just go, what am I doing this for if it's not to look good? And by the way, th let's, let's be real about this. Um, this is a whole other area that men like myself never really have to deal with. Culture is not very kind to women as women age. It is a, a very yeah. disappointing and um, troubling sort of aspect of things. Women are judged based on their looks, whether they like it or not in this culture. And it's incredibly superficial. And, um, but think about that. Like uh, men are usually judged on power, right? And you know, other, other sort of other measures, how much money they make and that kind of thing. It's very difficult for women to sort of be able to walk that line and hold those two things and say, well, what's my value then if I don't look good the way culture says? Now, rightly so, we've all been, men and women have been battling against this sort of cultural construct, but I'm not so sure any woman can really ever truly escape it, even though we all know it is sort of um, a ridiculous and tragic aspect of our culture. However, the women who do and the women who show up and are able to inspire others are the ones who will change that narrative. And that is a very important narrative uh, to change. I have no idea what that must be like. I have other things about being a man that are, you know, not the best things in the world, you know, being judged in certain ways. But we but I do think that is a big one that women sort of carry with them at all ages. And this is another aspect of this coming uh, you know, like me having brothers surrounding me and helping me helps manage my stress psychologically and helps manage my metabolic stress. And it's the same when you have your sisters around you and the people who the women in your life that you're sort of teaching and learning from. It's very important. Is I would totally agree with that. And, you know, reaching out and just talking and you know, staying in touch with a variety of women. And, and the, um, the older I get, the more I realize the value of having relationships and friendships with women in a variety of decades and men too. Mm -hmm. You know, I think um, my husband and I are at an age where we have friends that are 30 years younger than us. And we have friends that are 20 or even 30 years older than us. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting to the give and take that goes on. And, and there's so much value just mm. from, from these conversations and relationships. Yeah, true wisdom, right? That's a really interesting place to be because I think it, it what it does is it reminds you of, you know, sort of uh, the wisdom above and also the wisdom below. And you get to absorb both of those and integrate those. And it puts you in a unique position to help both parties. Yeah, yeah, we help and we are helped. And one of the things, I think this might be in your intro that I really, of your podcast, you talk about three things. Maybe it's three things that we aspire to do in life and that's to learn, to teach and to love. Mm. And I just yeah. love when you talk about that. I, I, um, I, my, my take on this is that there's, I call it the three imperatives. And so to me, I go, there's only three reasons that we're on this planet to begin with. It's to learn, it's to teach, and it's to love. Love being synonymous with sharing. And sharing what? Sharing our creative pursuits, sharing the things that we create and giving them freely to the world without need for reciprocation or acknowledgement. But in order to get there, we first go through this stage of sort of learning and absorbing. And then once we learn enough and get some wisdom and get some experience, we then, in my mind, must begin to teach. Of course, we never stop learning, we're still learning, but then we start to begin to teach some of the things that we learn. And then we have to create. And this can be done in many different ways. Some people choose to do it through children. Some people choose to do it through art. Other people choose to do it through uh, entrepreneurial pursuits or their work or whatever it is. But we have to have that legacy fulfillment aspect and not legacy in an ego sense, mm -hmm. but legacy more in the fact that I'm here. What can I do so that when my time is over, the world is made better in some small way, probably in a way that I myself will never truly be aware of. But we know what this is like. We know and we have had people in our lives that have touched us probably in some small way that we can go, wow, that made a difference that perhaps we never told them, they never knew. Maybe we never even knew who they were. It could have been someone helping you in a particular way, someone saying something that brought an insight 
um, a book you read, a piece of artwork you loved, people you may not even know. What I would say is that each of us on this planet are like a spiritual fingerprint. There's not ever been anyone like Judy, like you ever, ever in the history of humanity. Think about that for a minute, nor will there ever be again. You are a unique spiritual fingerprint. The ripples that you make with your life uniquely impact all the things around you. Now, part of what we do as humans, we can get very egotistical about that. We want to see what it is and we want to, you know, um, take credit for it. But instead, if we just do our work and we learn and we teach and we love and we just focus on these three imperatives, there's no need for us to know. But at the end of our lives, and I think this is what everyone wants in the end, we don't want happiness. We want fulfillment. What's the difference? Happiness is a fleeting state. You really have to go searching for happiness. Fulfillment is this idea that I set out to do something and I did it. I, I was a particular human. I had a particular skill set, uh, some you know, signature strengths, and I used them to better myself, to grow myself and better the world. And when we achieve something like that, at the end of our lives, we might lose people, we might get ill, we might be in suffering and pain, but we can always feel a sense of pride in how we've showed up. We can't feel happy in those moments, but we can feel a sense of fulfillment and achievement. And so really what we're talking about here as humans doing this work is fulfillment. And I actually, everyone listening to this, Judy and I might be the professionals here talking to all of you. However, when what I'm talking about right now has nothing to do with expertise. All it has to do with going out in the world and showing up in the way that only you can, in the positive way that you can. And I'll give you one hint here. Most people get this wrong because what they do is they go through life having had pain, the Buddhists say, life is dukkha, life is suffering. Everyone will have pain. No one gets out of this without pain. The people who feel fulfilled at the end of their life are the ones who take their pain, learn from it, find that same pain in others and look to heal it in them. The people who don't feel that way and feel regretful are the people who passed their pain on or played the victim. That is the difference between someone who feels fulfilled at the end of their life and someone who feels regretful and resentful and fearful at the end of their lives. That is beautiful. It's like taking circumstances and literally making the best of it, mm -hmm. you know, Absolutely. Versus, and, versus being angry. <laughs> and, and, and one distinction there, making the best of it, not for ourselves, just ourselves, but making the best of it for others. others. That's the difference, right? As soon as it's just about us, it's no longer purpose. As soon as we make it about making the world better in the way that only we can, that's when everything changes. That's when you go into your hero self and your next level human self. I absolutely love that. Finding a way. Thank you. And this is a great way to wrap up. This is, mm -hmm. and you have helped so many people, you know, through your books, through your podcast, through your courses. And now you have, if you can want to let people share I don't know if you're still promoting it. You're, you're coming out with a new certification. Mm -hmm. um, and that is called the metabolic female. So that certification is available for any of you who are professionals and any of you who are not metabolic renewal is sort of a good place to start to, to sort of begin this journey that Judy and I talked about. So, well, I will put all of that in the show notes in case anyone wants more information on it. I really want to thank you for taking the time today to speak. This has been, um, I think super enlightening mm. and, you know, coming at the end here, the, one of the best things is, you know, it's okay to be who we are. Mm. And we, we really, this is kind of my interpretation of a lot of this conversation is we have to live in the present. We can't go back to old methods. What we've gone through is, you know, put us through for a purpose. And as we learn how we've come through with these problems, it is our job to go ahead and share it with the world so that other people might do better. 100%. And thank you for doing that, Judy. Thank you for your work. Well, many thanks to Dr. Jade for chatting with us today. That was just so informative, I think. And uh, in the show notes, I'll pop in some contact information for him. And uh, remember to check back every Tuesday for a new episode. If you're interested in any of 
his programs or mine, you can again look at the show notes and I'll have references to both on there. So in the meantime, I love the fact that we don't have to overstress, we get to relax. I love the fact that having balance is the best advice ever. 